welcome back. In the last video, I had shown you how to write a generalized linear regression routine. Uh, we had decided, uh, we had discussed how to take x as a vector uh, with a scalar y as output and how to map one to the other using a linear model. So, in this um, short video, I would like to show you how to code this up. I am going to just briefly go over it. We will leave the responsibility of reading the code and understanding it to you for the most part. Um, this is a simple uh, MATLAB routine which will be available in you uh, uh, with you for the uh, uh, in the NPTEL website in the week 4 uh, portions. So, what I have written here is a function. So, this function uh, which we have called generalized linear regression. A simpler version of this without all the comments is available in lin model. It is exactly the same as this code. Both these codes are available to you on your uh, NPTEL website. Once again, I am repeating this, but you are welcome to write some such thing for yourself in any other language that you are comfortable with. So, this is just for your understanding. So, what we have here is a regression model which takes in x the input vector y the corresponding output vector. Remember, you have a whole bunch of examples which is why I have written input matrix here because x for each example is actually a vector okay. as we discussed in the previous video x could itself have x 1, x 2, x 3 etcetera depending on the number of features or attributes that you have. Alpha is the learning rate that you think will be good for this problem and epsilon is the stopping criteria for the problem. The output which this function gives out is the whole weight vector and notice as we had discussed in the last video, I am actually including the bias term w0 which some people call uh, b. I am including that in the weight vector. Therefore, the size of the weight vector has to be these n features plus the one bias. Okay. So, the first thing that you do since we have not given it explicitly, this is your choice. MATLAB has an easy way for you to determine the size of the incoming data this might or might not be available in other programming languages. So, we have used this feature easily. So, we find out the number of examples m and the number of features n simply by looking at the size of x. We also make an initial guess notice it is n plus 1 is the size of the vector because you include w 0 also and then this is all of it is the same as before. You actually iterate for w using gradient descent. Notice now that the hypothesis function is not simply w0 plus w1x, but w0 plus w1x1 plus w2x2 up till wn xn, which can be written as w transpose x in case w is the modified w, including w0 also, and assuming that x0 is equal to 1. Okay. So, we find out the hypothesis function, you will notice a 1 sitting here. This 1 is sitting because I am writing x0 explicitly, x is simply x1 through xn. Okay. Um, there are many ways of writing it, I have left that as an exercise to you. I have written a slightly inefficient version, but you can write more efficient versions. Okay. Once again like before, you have several choices for stopping criteria, either you can choose the difference between the current value of the loss function and the previous value of the loss function or you can find out how much do the current, how much does the current w differ from the previous w. In either case, we will simply call the stopping criterion as error and the moment the till it is greater than epsilon, it will keep on running. Our main task of course, is to find out the gradients of j with respect to the weight vector w. I have written the formulation here, we had also derived it twice in the previous videos and you will notice prediction error multiplied by the corresponding feature component. So, if you look at del j del w r, it is going to be 1 by m times summation of the prediction error y hat minus y multiplied by x r, okay, which is what I have written here. d j is what denotes uh, del j del w. Notice that d j has n plus 1 component starting from the first component which will co correspond to w 0 and will go up till n plus 1 which will correspond to n. So, we take that, we calculate the change in w. w is of course, w minus alpha times grad j. Okay. Finally, we calculate what the hypothesis is and this lets us calculate the j okay, because y minus y hat square 
uh, averaged over all the other uh, all the examples actually gives you j. I have also included some plots just for similarity from before and we can try running it in order to see how this performs. Now, the important thing here is this is really general you can take any number of examples any number of m and also you can choose any number of features. Okay. So, the code is supposed to work and as we discussed in the previous video this lets us use not only linear regression, but it also lets us use polynomial regression because all you need to do is to change w 1 to the x power 1 w 2 to x power 2 x square and uh, w n multiplying x power n. Okay. So, if x the incoming vector is basically x 1 x 2 x 3 x n you can simply use that as the features you as the polynomials and that will work. Okay. So, let us now try using our original data and see if we can now use our generalized code generalized linear regression code in order to make a linear quadratic and cubic predictions. You will see one small surprise here which will lead us to a small modification for what we want to do for linear regression. Okay. So, as before t was the initial data and the alpha is y. Uh, notice that alpha is multiplied by 10 power minus 6 as the uh, expansion coefficient. Okay. So, initially we uh, define x as t and y as alpha, we choose a learning rate of 1, we choose an epsilon of 10 power minus 5 and we will try running our generalized linear regression code and see what happens. So, when we run it, please notice what is happening here you can see these numbers growing larger and larger. In fact, j is rapidly increasing and j has now reached 10 power 247 and y has also reached 10 power 128 for the prediction because we are not getting convergence, we are actually getting divergence. Now, you might decide that this is because of a large alpha and try and reduce it. So, let us say we make alpha 0.1 instead of 1 and we try running it again and you will see that the situation has not really improved. It is still blowing up, okay. you have still got high values of j and you have got high values of y. Okay. Now, why does this happen? This happens due to a subtle reason that is because the t that you have here or the x that you have here, if I write x, let us try writing x here. Please notice x is going from 80 to minus 340. Of course, our y's are 10 power minus 5 times all these values. So, your coefficients that need to come so that this x can be mapped to this y are extremely small. Okay. All these problems are essentially what are called normalization problems. Okay. For example, let us say you are matching the area of a house to its price an example that I have used before. Okay. So, in what units will you give the area? You could make the area in you know square foot which is the normal thing or you can make it in square meters. You could make it in square kilometers in which case your input vector will look really small or you could make it square centimeters etcetera. Similarly, suppose you are mapping the height of a person to his or her weight and that is the regression problem that you wish to do. In what units should you represent height? Should you represent it in micrometer? Should you represent it in meter which seems reasonable to us or should you represent it in foot etcetera. If you represent it in kilometers, your numbers, your input vector will look really small and your weights will change appropriately. So, we tend to try and use units where you normalize x so that typically it varies to the order of 1. Okay. So, that turns out to be the simplest thing to do. You can make it so that it varies from let us say minus 5 to 5 or from 0 to 1 which is probably the easiest. So, the choice that we will do right now and this step is called normalization or rescaling is to rescale the data. So, that I have a new x, I will also rescale y, you know remember we have all these numbers and I was multiplying by 10 power minus 6 which is arbitrary as far as the code is concerned. I will comment this out, so that y is now simply these numbers, x is rescaled 
the way this rescaling was done is x goes to x minus minimum of x by maximum minus minimum. Okay. When you do this, this x n will actually get rescaled so that it is only between 0 and 1. So, now that we have done the rescaling, let us try and see what x looks like. So, we have new x here. If I write it out, you will notice that it goes between 0 and 1. Okay. So, you can see that the maximum is 1 and the minimum is 0. This corresponds to the following x which was 80 to minus 340. All we have done is x has been rescaled the minimum has been subtracted out and has been rescaled by the range. Okay. So, now x goes from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. Okay. And now we can try and see what happens when we continue our code. Okay. For the same alpha you will now see that the linear fit starts working. Okay. So, there is a drastic difference when we did not rescale it was going completely wrong because the values of x were high and the corresponding value of y hat was also high. So, you can see that subtle things can actually make a great difference as far as training goes. Training means finding out the coefficients. So, you will see that the fit is now working and the only change we made was we rescaled the data. Okay. We rescaled the data instead of having original x, now you have x between 0 and 1. Okay. So, this trick is an important trick. In fact, it has been generalized to something really big called batch norm, which you will see later on in the course. Okay. Okay, so, I will stop this simulation. Now, another thing you can do is with the same code, we can now try and get quadratic. So, notice this, we keep the same x n, we keep the same y n. All I change is, now I change my feature vectors and I say that the input is not only x but it is x as well as x square. Now, our code is written such that the moment I give it one extra x or an extra feature, okay, it will start reading more features and it will fit a bigger model. Okay. So, this is the trick that we used. The moment I give x and x square, obviously the code does not know you have given x square as the second variable, all it knows is x 1 and x 2. So, the moment it sees x 1 and x 2, it will say that my model is now no longer w naught plus w 1 x 1, but it is w naught plus w 1 x 1 plus w 2 x 2, which serves our purposes because x 2 is now x square. Okay. So, let us see that now. Just to show you what happens, I will run this again. So, if you come here, you will now see that the number of features that the code is recognizing is 2. And you will also notice that w is now a 3 by 1 vector and this is the initial guess. It has given an initial get of guess of 0 0.8 for w0, 0 0.14 for w1 and 0.42 for w2 and this serves our purposes. Okay. So, we will continue here and you will see that now it is trying to fit. It is trying to fit a curved line, a quadratic line to this data. I will let you run this uh, on your own and it is not very hard to change this into a cubic fit because all you need to do is to add this extra term okay. and we can now start from scratch and run this and it will try and fit a cubic plot. Okay. You can see that this is slightly more curved and uh, I would encourage you to play around with this code or write one on your own and see what sort of fits you can get for uh, this kind of data. Okay. You can of course, try it for any data. So, what we have seen in this video is that rescaling helps you and that you can actually fit with the same code, you can fit a linear, a, a quadratic or a polynomial depending on what sort of input vector you give it. I will write down what is needed uh, to do this once more. So, if we look at normalization or rescaling, what we did was x became x minus x min by x max minus x min and let us call this x tilde for our purposes and this is our new input vector 
what this does of course, is x tilde now will vary between 0 and 1. There are other alternatives for rescaling. This is to say x tilde is equal to x minus mu by sigma, where mu is the mean of the data and sigma is the standard deviation of the data. Typically, this is called normalization and this does not ensure that you are going to lie between 0 and 1, it will usually go between negative 3 to plus 3 or somewhere in that range. This is simple rescaling. Okay. So, you can use one or the other, normalization is used in with great effect in something called batch norm. Batch norm is very, very effectively used in several deep neural networks and you will see this a little bit later. Okay. 